So now, uh, last but not least, um, I will be introducing our, one of our imaging technicians and photographers, Isabel reynolds Log. So Isabel is a photographer currently working on the Lotus Sutra Scrolls you know, conservation and digitization projects at the British Library. And after completing a Bachelor of Arts and Sciences at the University College London, she developed her interest in cultural heritage photography whilst working at the Postal Museum. This led to a traineeship at the National Archives, where she was on secondment to UCL and the Institute of Education, digitizing the UCL special collections and cataloging IOE collections. She founded Strange City Press in early 2021 as a means to put together and publish photozines, both of her own photographs and those of other photographers. So please um, join me in welcoming Isabel. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming to my presentation on uh, the digitization of Lotus Sutra scrolls. Um, today, I would like to talk to you about the imaging of the scrolls, how we did it, and the challenges faced. Um, and firstly, I'd like to say that the imaging of the Lotus Sutra scrolls has been vital in preserving the items and making them more accessible. This project would not have been possible without the input of many different teams, but I would especially like to thank the conservators who we've just heard from, Tanya Estrada Valadez, Marie Kalajev, Paulina Kralka, Maria Muzat, and Claire Valero for working so hard to prepare these items for imaging. Okay. So I'd like to begin with an overview of the imaging process. Um, we had a target of 11,000 centimeters of scrolls to be imaged per month, which took a lot of planning. Um, I would locate the items available to order to the studio, and these would be the ones that have passed through conservation and been marked green, uh, ready for digitization. Um, and then I would coordinate with our preservation assistant, who was uh, Vicky Mansfield, who worked with us for the project. And she would be retrieving the items uh, so I would send her a list of items needed, organizing delivery dates, and continue to do this throughout the month so that we would not have more than we would need at a time in the studio for the item's protection. It's important to keep track of items' movements in a project such as this um, to prevent anything going missing and things like that. So once the items were delivered, I would check them into a logbook in the studio, but also update them online on our logging system to show their current location as a record of the items' movements around the building. Once the items were in the studio, I would plan which items to do on which day. Uh, if the item was standard, which I would say a horizontal scroll, I would make sure the lights were angled at 45 degrees um, and do the, the general camera checks that we always do here. And then if the item was non-standard, such as items in Melinex, um, or perhaps the concertina item that I'll show later, things that are more object-like, the setup would be quite different. So it takes a lot more thought. So the first image that we always take is a control shot using the golden thread target in the center of the item. This is vital for accurate color capture of the collection items uh, because we do not want to have to capture these items ever again, hopefully, for the uh, preservation of these items. We do not want to handle them more than we need to. <coughs> So then once this is um, captured and we have set our white balance and made sure everything is looking good, uh, we would capture the item, including all the recto and all the verso panels. Um, I would shoot from the first panel to the last, rolling the scroll with a conservation approved method that they taught me. Um, and during capture, I would check that all the images are consistent and in focus, and checking also for debris, which became really important, um, removing that if necessary. And then we would set the crop and rotation of the images, process the raw images out, and then it would be time to do the majority of our work, which was post-production, in Photoshop. We would image the, edit the images to have a digital black border and remove anything used to hold the item flat. Once each image had been edited, they would be stitched together to create a digital surrogate of the entire scroll. Once this was complete, the images would then move on to the QC officer, Francisco Perez Garcia, um, to be checked with his eagle eyes, looking for things like debris um, and errors created by Photoshop. More on that later. So I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge that this imaging project um, required a lot of post-production, um, including the addition of digital black background and removing anything used to hold the scroll flat. And this is not something generally done in cultural heritage imaging. The goal is always to capture the item and create a digital surrogate as close to the real item as possible. 
Um, and for this project, it is important for me to acknowledge that the individual panels are closer to reality than the stitched image is. We create that in Photoshop, and it has a manipulation by our own hands. Um, there is too much at play for this image to be an exact replica. However, the stitch scroll is a created object, um, and the scrolls would never be viewed completely unrolled in real life, so in that sense it helps to give an idea of the physicality of the item and hopefully aids readers and researchers when viewing the item online. Okay, so I just want to talk a bit about improvements made over the course of this project as it was um, a long project with many different uh, people involved and... Um, yeah, since we're joining the project in 2020, I've worked to develop and improve the imaging process. Um, a key consideration in the cultural heritage photography, as I've said, is capturing the item as true to reality as possible, and editing images not, is not generally done. Um, on this project, the standards were set a long time ago and included added, adding this digital black background or removing anything holding the item down, whereas normally these would be left in. Um, therefore, it was important for me to keep editing to a minimum and always do so sensitively to the item. So this is uh, one major change that was made, which was um, the project began by using these gold pins with Melinax tabs um, to protect the item. Uh, but obviously, as you can see, this covers quite a lot of the item, so it's not ideal for editing them out to remove them. Um, so I decided to go through some different trials beginning with these plastic Munich fingers uh, that we generally use for all other uh, digitization projects. But these are not ideal because they are quite thick and they left quite a lot of shadow and they're also slightly tapered uh, at the end. So they weren't ideal in holding the item down. Finally, I tried using a PEL conservation spatula that a conservator left with me to remove debris with, actually. Um, and this turned out to be the perfect solution. Um, <laughs> they are flat, slightly weighted, um, and they are really narrow. Uh, so they can hold down the scroll's edge with the smallest tip resting on it. Here you can see it's over, going over the scroll quite a bit more, but it doesn't really matter because that's uh, Japanese tissue infill. So it's not such a problem editing that as it's not real scroll. Um, <laughs> So I would try to place the spatulas on the very edge of the item, um, and hopefully with an area that had no text or markings, so the editing would be minimal. Um, again, you can see them being removed. <laughs> Another, um, oh, I think I have one more. Yeah. So um, uh, just another improvement made was at the digital black background stage. Um, instead of using black paper as the background for imaging, which does come out quite gray, I switched to dark black velvet type material. Um, this helps add, when adding digital black around the scroll, um, because you would select the edges of the scroll in Photoshop, bump it out a bit to take in some of the edges of the scrolls are very fibrous, and you don't want to lose any of that um, when you're uh, editing the, the background. Um, and then the background, the, the black velvet background was so dark you wouldn't be able to see, um, see it if there was any showing through. So now I'm going to talk about debris, which played a huge role in this project. Um, our QC officer, Francisco, would check each image rigorously looking for debris. Um, most often, this would be a stray hair from a brush uh, used in conservation or perhaps human, maybe from one of us or maybe historic, we're not sure, um, or some loose Japanese tissue from the conservation process. Um, these can be brushed off before shooting, um, but if I missed any, the QC officer would pick them up and I would have to redo the image somehow. So this would either be an editing job or a reshoot if it was too tricky to edit out. Sometimes debris would obscure a character, and in this case, it's better to reshoot that panel to avoid over-editing the text itself. However, sometimes editing is preferable as we want to handle the item as little as possible and unrolling it, <coughs> again, just for one... Uh, piece is not ideal. So here are some examples. There's a bit of debris on this. It's there. <laughs> and, and that's it removed. Here's another one. Again, it's like so small, but this is what he's looking for. And that's it removed. So these are really simple as it's just editing the black. Here's a hair. 
that was it edited out. And again, on, even on the verso where there's no text, we're still looking for debris, so there's a hair there, probably mine, and then that's edited out. <laughs> and then in some cases, and to my relief, uh, the supposed debris is actually the scroll itself. Um, sometimes they can just be particularly fibrous and this can look like loose hairs on the top of the item, or they can just be marks that look like debris. So there's just some examples here of things that were picked up as debris, but are actually just the scroll. And in some cases, um, it's meant to be left on the item. So I always would check with conservation if they want to remove this or leave it on. And this is part of the item's history, so it stays. Um, and in some, um, I just wanted to cover assisted digitization. So sometimes the items are so fragile, even after conservation, um, or after leaving, the, they've decided to leave the item, that they require imaging to be done with the conservator present. Um, and in this case, the conservator handles the item completely, and I would just be shooting it. And here you can check, see us checking for debris before shooting, because especially with items like this, you really don't want to get it out again. OK, now, oh, sorry about this. I'm not sure what happened. It's something when we've moved the PowerPoint over. Um, so now I'm just going to quickly cover items in Melinex, which the conservators have explained what that is, so I don't need to do that. Um, generally, they are just fragments or single panels, and shooting these requires a bit of a different imaging setup to avoid reflections from the plastic material. We tend to shroud the imaging area in a dark black material covering the lights and the camera to avoid reflections. It's not so problematic with this project because we're editing the background anyway, but we still have to consider this. And I think this is going to show it. Yes, now it's, that's the background added. Um, now I just want to show you doing some different things with the items and the images. Um, we always do, oops, sorry, standard, standard digitization with the items so that it's captured for preservation and access. I think this is just showing it um, going through the different panels. Um, this is actually a concertina item. OK, so this is actually the item. So as you can see, in reality, its physical form is quite um, interesting. And sometimes imaging it flat can take away from that. Um, so to better demonstrate its physicality, we sometimes do things like this. Um, and we use different techniques to best suit the item. Um, for example, this item required focus stacking, which is taking multiple images from the front of the item with the focus shifting through the item to the very back so that every single bit of the item would be in focus. And that's it, ultimately. I think this is the recto, which is not a Lotus Sutra, but I think this is, where's Melody, chapter 25? Yeah. <laughs> um, and again, just some top down shots of it um, to, to show a bit more its uh, physical shape. And we also made some GIFs from these images, um, just for fun, really, and to be used on social media to give more of an idea of the physicality of some items. These are just a couple of oddities, like bits of um, wood. They're quite, we don't have anything else really like this. So this was a nice thing to try out, aside from scrolls. This is this item we've seen earlier on today. Um, just showing it encased in its wrapper. And these are just some kind of fake stitching uh, GIFs to kind of show the process. And this was also mentioned earlier. We put this to Twitter to see what they thought this flap might be, if it was perhaps a missing page or not. Um, I'm not really sure what the consensus was, but it generated some conversation. OK, so now I would quickly like to cover multispectral imaging, which we've been trying um, to reveal hidden text that would otherwise go unread. Certain scrolls have patches that were added on, um, probably for reinforcement, as you've heard from the conservators. And sometimes these contain text themselves from other documents, or they are covering text on the scroll. Um, so first, alongside my colleague Eugenio Falcioni, we captured the item in visible light. Um, and then using a light box, we captured it 
using transillumination, which is shining light through it. And you can clearly see there's something there. And then this was still not really clear enough. So we tried capturing the same image, but using an infrared filter on the lens to take in wavelengths that you cannot see with your own eyes. And it's not really that clear on the screen, but you can make out more of the, the characters here. So these um, wavelengths are normally invisible, but using this filter, we can render them visible. And this gave the best results in terms of legibility. This is just showing uh, the verso, because that's where the patch was added on this one. So this is the recto. You can't see it, but it's just there. The same process again. And again, you can make out some hidden characters there. And finally, this patch covering. OK, so um, this is us, like you've heard from the conservators, with the very last scroll of the project. Um, and in total, the, over the course of the last few years, we've imaged 793 scrolls, which this is only the um, recto length, so it would be double that, as Tan mentioned earlier, and around almost 17,000 images. Uh, now I'd just like to finish with a time-lapse film made of the whole imaging and editing process, um, made with the help of my colleagues Elizabeth Hunter and Carl Norman, showing the imaging... Um And as you can kind of tell, uh, the imaging process is so much quicker than, I mean, that's sped up, obviously, but it's so much quicker than conservation. So um, it was quite challenging to manage over the course of the whole project. Just a personal thanks to everyone involved in the project um, that's helped me in many different ways, including just moral support over the last few years. Um, we had challenging times working through COVID, but we made it and we finished. So congratulations, everyone. And yeah, thank you for listening.